All right, so welcome to chapter four, pesticide formulations. And before we dive in, I just want to say that this is actually a very long chapter. There's a lot of information in this. I highly encourage that even if you watch this presentation to just view the notes and listen to it again. Um, there's a lot of different types of pesticide formulations out there and you're probably gonna be tested on which one's what and how do you know? Um, so without further ado, let's get into it. I guess before we get into it, this one's probably going to be closer to an hour, 45 minutes. There's quite a, quite a bit of information. So, you know, don't feel bad if you have to break this up into multiple parts. Okay. Oh, let me, uh, I'm going to adjust myself out of here and just be the slide. Okay, so we got pesticide formulations. What is a pesticide formulation? It's a combination of active and inert ingredients that forms an end use pesticide product. Pesticides are formulated to make them safer and easier to use. Concentrate forms, many are highly toxic. Many do not mix well with water. Some are unstable and some are difficult to transport and store. Inert ingredients. Those are the ingredients that have no pesticidal activity. They serve as dilutants or carriers, and they also make formulated products safer, easier to handle and apply, and more effective. Um, most pesticides contain carriers or dilutants. Um, some contain stickers and spreaders already in the formulation, and then some contain stabilizers and dyes. The overview of formulations, active ingredients. Some are derived from plants like azadactrin, pyrethrum, rot rotenone. Now, I might be saying that one wrong, R-O-T-E-N-O-N-E, -E, rotenone. Some are derived from microbes or insects such as Bacillus thuringiensis or piproxifen. Bacillus thuringiensis is a bacteria and it's used to kill caterpillars. There's also various strains. Some strains specifically target uh, larvae of mosquitoes. Piproxifen is a um, insect growth regulator that's used with a lot of different insects. So they're derived from their hormones. Uh, some active ingredients are created in labs and they vary considerably in their physical, chemical, and structural properties. Um, solubility. That's how easily it can disperse into water or its carrier. And some require solvents to dissolve into a carrier. Liquid pesticides are generally uh, solution, suspension, emulsion. What are solutions? Solutions are uh, a substance that dis dissolves in a liquid. True solutions cannot be separated. Okay, so once they're, once they're mixed, they cannot be undone. Um, suspension is a liquid mixture. It's disbursement of fine particles within a liquid. So it's not necessarily like what you would think. You have to envision, you know, these little tiny particulates are just evenly spread out amongst the water. Um, a good representation of that, I think, is like a micro encapsulation formula. If you look at that, that's kind of how it is with water. Um, but the particles do not dissolve. They're just evenly di dispersed within the water. They must be agitated, and the reason for that is so that that way they have uniform distribution, and they can appear as cloudy or opaque, and they really do need continuous agitation to stay mixed. Emulsions, emulsions, which go by E or EC, and the reason why there's an E or an EC, EC means emulsifiable concentrate. Um, they're a special kind of suspension. They're droplets of one type of liquid suspended in another. Uh, generally dissolved in an oil-based solvent and then mixed with water. They may require agitation. Most contain emulsifiers or emulsifying agents already packaged within them. And they can have a milky appearance. Uh, dry products are usually made by adhering to the active ingredient to a substance like talc powder, 
uh, clay, silica, paint residues, things like that. Concentrates, they can be um, liquid or solid. Liquid, you're looking at like an emulsifiable concentrate. Solids, you're looking at wettable powders, otherwise known as WP. Uh, soluble powders, SP. Water dispersible granules or dry flowables, WDG or DF. Um, there's ready to use products and those do not require further dilution. Some examples, um, aerosol, dust, pellet, granule, baits, ready to use residentials. And that's what they're intended for. They're intended for residential use. Okay, so concentrates. Why would we buy concentrates versus like a ready to use product? Well, they're less expensive and that's good for us in the business because we can take a concentrate, we can dilute it down to what we need and then we can use it and apply it. Um, the downside of that is that they're more toxic because they're concentrated and they require more handling when you're dealing with them because you have to dilute it. You have to pour it into a measuring cup and then that measuring cup gets poured into your tank. You might need to handle it again, add some more, um, things of that nature, right? So you're at higher risk of exposure with concentrates. And then generally speaking, the uh, in a lot of products, the, the product name states the percentage of active ingredient. So in one of the previous chapters, we talked about Tempo 20. Um, that 20 represented 20% active ingredient in that product. So how do we decide the, what formulation that we should use? Well, we have to look at the legality of it and the label use, and those will tell us quite a bit. Um, can you legally apply it where you intend to apply it? Um, you know, does the label have the sites listed, the pests listed? That's going to be your first thing, right? Does it have the pests that you want? Uh, the other thing would be the signal word. If you can find a product that has a signal word of danger poison, but you can find another product that has maybe caution or warning, and they're both going to achieve the same result, well, you want to use the least toxic one. So you want to go with that caution or warning signal word. Um, applicator safety, that's pretty much, you know, going back off the signal word. You want to look at the applicator safety. And so if you can use the right product, the right formulation, that's going to reduce the chances of anything happening to an applicator or the environment for that matter, then you want to do that. Uh, you also want to decide the pest biology. So are you going to use an adulticide trying to kill larvae or eggs? Probably not. So you want to, you know, choose your product based on the life cycle stage that you're at, the least toxic, and, you know, the most legal product, legal and safe product that you can at the time. Um, site characteristics, you know, what are you doing? Are you making a, a trunk injection to a tree? Could you do that in a different manner that wouldn't harm the tree? Um, so yeah, target the surface to be treated. You know, you don't want to use certain corrosive products on like a concrete or an asphalt or any sort of metal because they can corrode it. And you also, you know, you got to take that into account that you could damage somebody's property by using the wrong product. Um, you also want to use just what's appropriate and available for your application equipment. You know, not everything is available and not everything is designed to be used with certain types of equipment. So we always want to make sure that we're using what's appropriate for our needs. So now we're going to talk about liquid formulations. And there's a lot of differences, different kinds. And we're going to kind of dive into um, why they're different and how they're used. And I will say that guaranteed on the exam you are going to have to determine, you know, what is this describing? Is this an emulsifiable concentrate? Is it a solution? Is it a suspension? Is it a wettable powder? You know, they're going to ask questions for you to determine that. And so these are the top things of each liquid formulation right now that I could extract from the book and put in this presentation. So emulsifiable concentrates, always pretty much signaled with E or EC. They usually contain oil or an oil-soluble liquid active ingredient. Um, they usually require a mixing agent of some kind. Um, most are between two to six pounds of active ingredient 
per gallon, and they're the most versatile to use. The advantages of an emulsifiable concentrate is that it's easy to store, handle, and transport. It's easy to pour and measure, minimal agitation. It's not abrasive to equipment, which in the long run can save you money, and it leaves little residue. Um, some disadvantages to the emulsifiable concentrate is that it's a high concentration of active ingredient. Uh, it's easy to overdose your solutions. You can have calibration errors. You can have and cause phytotoxicity. Um, you're more susceptible to a dermal absorption. You can have splashes, spills. You have to clean it up, which causes more exposure. They might have an odor depending on you know what they are. And you might re require solvents with them, which solvents can cause equipment wear and tear. Um, some of that might be pitting, discoloration. Uh, they can be flammable and possibly corrosive. Now we're going to talk about solutions. Um, the active ingredient of solutions readily dissolves in a liquid solvent, water or petroleum based. It does not separate or settle. It works with any type of sprayer and it's useful on numerous different sites. And then we have ready to use formulations. Basically no further dilution is needed. It's a small quantity of active ingredient. Um, professional ready to use products are generally found in structural institutional pests, stuff like that. Uh, when you think about, you know, baits, ant baits, um, rat baits, things like that, those are ready to use. The advantages of some ready to use products are that they're convenient. There's no mixing or measuring required. They're generally small packages. Um, some are sold with devices to apply them. They don't require any loading. And overall, it's less exposure to the applicator. Uh, disadvantages to ready to use products is that they're limited availability on what you can purchase and what is ready to use. And they also are more expensive per unit versus concentrates. So kind of the inverse, right? We buy a concentrate, it's cheaper because we can dilute it. When you buy a ready-to-use product because of the packaging and the fact that that was already done at the factory, now it's you know more expensive, which makes sense. Uh, generally ready-to-use products are what you're gonna find with homeowners in big box stores. You know, you're ready to use Roundup or Triclopyr or 24D, that's what you're gonna find. Um, home defense comes to mind too, doing a, a perimeter treatment around the house. And then we have concentrate solutions, which goes by C, L, C, W, S, C, and W, S, L. Those are all different abbreviations for it. Um, C is for concentrate, L, C is liquid concentrate, and then we have water soluble concentrate, and then we have water soluble liquid. And that's why we have those abbreviations, but they all mean concentrate solutions. Um, when diluted, the label recommended carrier become, the, when diluted with the label recommended carriers, um, it becomes a true solution. And if we remember true solutions cannot be broken. So it's, it is, it's a true solution. It's not going to uh, separate or anything like that. Advantages of concentrate solutions that they're easy to handle, transport and store. No agitation is necessary. They're not abrasive and they have little residue. Disadvantages of concentrate solutions are their availability, spills, splashes, cleanup, and dermal absorption. So very similar to um, emulsifiable concentrates, but the difference with concentrate solutions is that they're true solutions. Liquid baits. So generally those are concentrated sugar solutions, specific bait stations, you know, rat baits, you might probably coyote baits, rabbit baits, um, ant baits, various things like that. And they're best in poor sanitation environments. And what's a poor sanitation environment? It's when the habitat is conducive for the pest. So you say you have a food establishment and you have ants, you know, you put a, a ant bait in the corner and you know that there's going to be ants there. They go to the bait and then they take it back to the colony and they die. Um, advantages of liquid baits, useful for ants. Tra I just said that transport AI to the colony useful as a rodenticide, uh, ideal where competitive food sources are abundant. The disadvantages are not all species will feed on them 
and you have to refill and replace them pretty frequently. Okay, liquid formulations continued. Ultra low volume, also known as ULV. ULV solutions are almost 100% active ingredient and they generally serve a special purpose and they're applied as a very fine droplet at low rates. Advantages of a uh, ultra low volume is it's easy to handle store transport. There's little to no agitation required, non-abrasive, little residue. But there's a lot of disadvantages. Um, there's a high drift hazard because when we're applying in a fine droplet, those little droplets can carry on to different locations pretty easily. Sometimes they require special equipment, which is an added cost. Um, there's a high risk of dermal and inhalation hazard. And also with that, it's at a higher concentration, so it can cause more damage and, and possibly worse health effects. Um, they can damage hoses, gaskets, pump parts, and calibration is difficult with ultra low volume. Invert emulsions. Invert emulsions are water soluble pesticides dispersed in an oil carrier. So typically fuel oil is what they're carried in. Um, its consistency is that of similar to mayonnaise. They're applied in large droplets, which minimizes the chance of drift, which is kind of nice. Um, the advantages to an invert emulsion is that it's a low drift potential, uh, increased penetration and absorption, and increased rain fastness, which being rain fast faster, uh, it reduces the runoff potential. Disadvantages to the invert emulsions, difficult to treat the undersides of foliage just because of the consistency of the material that you're spraying. And they're also a limited availability. Flowables, which go by F or AF, um, they're thick liquid suspension and they impregnate into a dry carrier. So advantages of flowables, they're easy to handle, um, easy to handle, apply, low exposure risk, minimal phytotoxicity, splashes less likely. The disadvantages of flowables is settling. So you have to make sure that you shake prior to measuring and mixing. They can be difficult to move. Um, containers can be difficult to rinse. They require a moderate amount of agitation and they can possibly be abrasive, which will wear and tear on your equipment, your pumps, your hoses, your nozzles, um, things like that. They also can make uh, cleaning up spills difficult and they can leave a residue type substance on surfaces. Aerosols. So aerosols generally can contain one or more active ingredient. There's two types of aerosols. There's ready to use pressurized sealed containers, which I think we all know about, right? You've seen wasp spray or WD-40 or, um, you know, off for mosquitoes, repellent. Those are all aerosols. Those are the, the ready to use containers. Um, but they can be made for electric or gas powered aerosol generators like smokers or foggers. Uh, I've personally seen these when I've worked at a commercial nursery. They used to um, close down the greenhouses and fog the entire greenhouse. So you want to talk about some epic coverage in an area. You know, they covered everything. Anything that was exposed got exposed to that fog and it killed the insects very, very well. Um, the advantages to ready to use aerosols is that they're easy and convenient. They're portable. Uh, they retain their potency. The disadvantage to ready to use aerosols is that they're limited special uses. There is an inhalation risk. It can be hazard if punctured or if left in a, a heated environment. And then um, you might have difficulty directing the material to where you actually want it to go. So formulations for smoke fog generators. Um, again, that's machine created smoke and fog. They're heated in two different ways, a rapid disc or a, a heated surface. They're really ideal for indoor insect control, greenhouses, barns, warehouses. Um, outdoor, they do have a purpose and generally they're used for mosquitoes or flies. 
Some advantages to those is that they're easy to fill an entire area with pesticide. Like I had talked about my experience seeing with them, seeing them in a greenhouse. Um, some disadvantages is that they're specialized use. You know, you don't want to use these everywhere. They're not for everything. You're not going to show up to a, a residential property and just park this thing in their driveway and let it go. It's not for that. Um, it requires special equipment. It's rather difficult to confine, you know, unless you have a really sealed area, it's really difficult to just, you know, stop it from leaving. It will definitely expose any sort of air leaks. Um, dealing with the concentrates, you might have splashes, spills, and have to clean it up. And most smoke fog generators and the products that go in them are likely going to require some sort of respiratory protection because there's a high inhalation risk, right? You're messing with a fogger. Uh, dry and solid formulations. So there's two types of dry formulations, ready to use in concentrates. Um, and then there's different, those are like the general overview types, but then there's different kinds um, like dust. Most dusts are ready to use. They typically have a low active ingredient. Very few have high concentrates of active ingredient. Some will have more than one active ingredient. You have to be careful when handling because you can be exposed to it pretty easily. Um, some particulate can drift away in winds and they're not water soluble. Some advantages of dust is that they're typically ready to use, which is really convenient. You don't have to mix them. Um, alternatively, for areas potentially damaged with spray, so if you're around a, a crop or a plant that's super susceptible to phytotoxicity of a certain kind, you might want to look for a dust so that way you don't damage that plant with phytotoxicity. Um, they require simple equipment. It's hard to good for hard to reach uh, indoor areas. Disadvantages of dust is the off-target drift, the residues, and the risk. Your risk is inhalation, eyes, nose, throat, and skin. You can have risk for all of those areas when you're applying a dust. Um, dampness can affect the product, so you want to keep it in a uh, monitored environment of humidity and temperature. Calibration can be difficult as well as distribution. All right, so now we're going to talk about granules. Uh, it's another dry or solid formulation. Granules are generally larger particles and they're heavier. They're not water soluble. Uh, they generally are ready to use. They also have a lower active ingredient. They're slow release, or some can be slow release. Uh, some require moisture to be activated. Mainly, granules are used for soil applications. They're typically systemic. They're also used in aerial applications to reduce drift. So if you want to get a product down into a plant, you take a plane, drive over a crop, disperse a granule now you don't have spray drift or anything like that it just falls right down to the ground below the canopy gets absorbed through the root system and up into the plant um, some advantages of granules is that they're ready to use low drift hazard low applicator hazard which is great for us um, they require simple equipment and they're slow release some disadvantages of granules is they that they require frequent calibration of equipment uh, they require a uniform application to be effect to be very effective. Um, they do not stick to where they go, so they can move around through uh, wind or you know heavy downpours. Um, they do create a hazard to non-target species, and they're bulky. Right, you're buying big, big bags of granules. Pellets, which are very similar to granules, but they're more uniform, so there's a higher precision. They're more ideal for spot treatments, which pellets goes by P or PS. Um, and then we have wettable powders, which go by WP or W. Wettable powders are dry, finely ground solids. Majority include wetting agents. They're typically mixed with water, and they can vary pretty substantially in the amount of active ingredient that they contain. Uh, it can be anywhere from 5 to 95% active ingredient. They do not dissolve in water. They're a suspension. Um, they're mixed with a small amount of water and then diluted into a larger amount of water. Some advantages of wettable powders is storage, transportation, handling. 
Uh, they're less likely to harm treated plants or animals uh, surfaces. They're not phytotoxic and there's less risk of a dermal or eye absorption. Um, some disadvantages of wettable powders, they're hard to measure. They're hard to mix. Uh, they have an inhalation hazard while mixing and measuring. They do require constant agitation. They are abrasive, so they will wear down your nozzles and equipment and pumps. Um, they can clog equipment, and they do leave visible residues. Water dispersible granules, otherwise known as WDG, and dry flowables, DF. Wettable powder compressed into a dust-free granule-sized particle. Um, most have product-specific measuring device. They're relatively easy to use, and they mix with water. They're applied as a suspension. Um, both wettable powders and dry flowables share advantages and disadvantages. Um, however, water dispersible granules are less risky to the handler. They reduce dust, and they're easier to move and measure, and that's because they're compressed to a dust-free granule. All right, soluble powders, SP or WSP, water-soluble powder. Um, they dissolve readily in water. They form a true solution, which means that they cannot be broken apart. After the initial mixing, um, no additional agitation is necessary. Their active ingredient can range from 15 to 95%. Uh, typically, they're more than 50%. Um, have, all, have all the advantages of... Wettable powders, the main disadvantage is inhalation hazard when mixing. Um, very few pesticides are soluble powders or wettable soluble powders. And very few active ingredients readily dissolve in water. Baits, that um, goes by B. Active ingredient is mixed with a food or attractive substance. Generally blocks granules or pellets is how they come. Some are liquids and gels and paste, mainly like cockroaches and ants, they'll be like that. Um, they're also usually a low active ingredient, like under 5%. Advantages of baits is that they're typically ready to use. The pest travels to it, and it controls pests that move in and out of the area. Uh, disadvantages of baits, baits are attractive to children. Children are very curious uh, creatures, and so they will want to go see what it is. And I have a couple of kids, and so I know that uh, they do want to go touch everything. And when they're really young, they don't mind trying to lick everything. So that's a main disadvantage of them. Um, they do have a potential to kill domestic animals and non-target wildlife, something that gets into the bait that's not supposed to. Or if um, um, an animal eats another animal that had eaten some bait and died. And with that, I think of like mice or rats. You know, if a mouse eats a mouse bait, goes, runs out and dies, and a bird of prey comes and eats it like a hawk or an eagle, then those can die from it because they ate the pesticide through the dead carcass. Um, they require careful placement. And another disadvantage is that dead pests can cause odor, obviously. That's mainly more of a vertebrae. And they're not ideal when pests have multiple food sources because they might not go to that. They might go to their preferred food source. Paste, gels, and other injectable baits, mainly used in um, structural pest control indoors. Ants, cockroaches, crack and crevice treatments. Um, advantages, odorless, no vapors, low human toxicity, long-lasting, low exposure. They're hidden, and you can accurately dose it. Uh, disadvantages are contamination. High temperatures can affect them or make them run. They can stain and... Um, Repeated applications could cause unsightly buildup. Fumigants. So I don't have too much experience with fumigants or fumigating anything. But I do know that sometimes houses require it. You know, bed bug applications, things like that. Um, fumigants are basically pesticides that are delivered in the form of a gas. Their main use is structural pest control, food and grain storage. Uh, regulatory pest control. It's a common way to kill foreign pests at ports of entry. Some advantages of fumigants is that they're toxic to a wide variety of pests. They penetrate. A single application kills majority of the pests in the treated area. 
main disadvantages is the target site must be enclosed. They're generally highly toxic to humans and other organisms. There's an extreme risk of inhalation. You need specialized equipment and possibly maintain specific temperature requirements. Microencapsulations. So that goes by M. Uh, they're dry and liquid pesticides surrounded by a coating, either plastic, starch, or some other kind. They generally you are used in a water carrier. They have a slow release active ingredient. They're weather dependent. They have a long residue and potentially a long um, REI. Some are highly toxic. The coating is um, used mainly to protect the handlers. They reduce odor staining. They reduce photo degradation and may be severely hazardous to bees. Uh, some are more prone to leaching so in soil applications. I think of like a, like a Scion, which is a product used for um, insecticides outside. They have mosquitoes labeled. It says that it's got a 75-day, um, it'll, it'll treat for 75 days. And so you think about, well, you have an insecticide that's active for 75 days and bees are flying all around. I mean, that could pose a super severe hazard to bees. Advantages of the microencapsulation is that the coatings protect the applicator. They're easy to mix, handle, and apply. Uh, time released, prolonged effectiveness, fewer applications needed, reduced volatility, reduced odor, reduced phytotoxicity. Some disadvantages of microencapsulation, uh, constant agitation depending on properties of the coating, the risk of bees, uh, the long um, REI, and pre-harvest intervals. All right, so now we have water-soluble packaging, WSB or WSP. It's generally a special film package or bag. It's a wettable powder, a soluble powder, or gel containing active ingredient. The package dissolves in water, which reduces um, exposure to the handler, to the pesticide applicator. Um, they do not dissolve in organic solvents or undiluted, uh, undiluted emulsifiable concentrates. Some advantages is that they're pre-measured, they're safer for the handlers, and there's lower risk of spills. However, the disadvantages are that the package size may not match the tank volume. So you might have too much product because it's rated for 100 gallons and you have a 50-gallon tank. So it's, it's difficult when it gets to that. Um, might not be suitable for large applications, could be expensive. Or you might have to put a ton of bags in a, a tank and it might take forever for it to dissolve. And they must be stored in dry, low humidity environments. Impregnants uh, incorporate AI into a solid material released over time through evaporation. Some examples would be like livestock ear tags, pet collars, fertilizers. Um, animal systemics can be applied externally, orally. Generally, they're systemic parasites, worms. Uh, liquid sprays, dust, food additives, capsules, paste. There's a lot of different ways that we give animals um, pesticides. Pesticide fertilizer combination. Generally, granule and pellet formulations. Uh, convenient because you're mixing. Common for homeowner, right? What comes to mind when you think of pesticide fertilizer combo? What comes to my mind is weed and feed, right? It's, I mean, it's taking those two words and making them super simple and Weed and feed, right? Pesticide fertilizer. And they can be custom blends. So you might, um, you know, talk to a manufacturer and get a specific blend for your need. I know some nurseries out there, they will incorporate bifenthrin um, granules into their soil. And then that'll get absorbed into the trees and shrubs and it'll protect them for longer. All right. So pesticide mixtures. Um Pesticide mixtures, tank mixing multiple products is convenient and cost effective, right? So we want to mix multiple pesticides, maybe add a fertilizer. You can save time and be more effective. Um, saves on labor, fuel, equipment wear and tear. Reduces soil compaction because you're not driving over it consistently all the time. Reduces mechanical damage to crops. You know, you've got a tractor, giant tank. He's getting ready to go spray the field. He wants to apply everything he needs at that time and just do it once. Uh, example, yeah, combining fungicide and insecticides in an agricultural setting or combining herbicides to control multiple kinds of weeds in a residential landscape setting. 
The federal law allows applicators to combine pesticides unless the label states otherwise. Applicators may mix pesticides with fertilizers and they may mix two or more pesticides. Uh, the dosage must be at or below label rate for each pesticide component. Adjuvants. So adjuvants are additives, right? They are chemical additives that affect how a pesticide works. They can improve the action of the pesticide or alter the characteristics of a pesticide formulation or spray mixture. Alone, they have no pesticidal activity. The EPA does not register them, which means there's no standards of quality, composition, or performance for adjuvants. Before using an adjuvant, check with the pesticide label, because some labels might say you can't use this, or you can use this, or we recommend this. So you really want to check the label. Most products contain adjuvants they need to be pro used properly. They already contain them. Additionally, adjuvants can increase or decrease the efficacy of, of an application. There's a lot of different types of adjuvants. So we're going to run through quite a, what they are. And some of them are pretty you know, self-explanatory, like this one, anti-foaming agents. What does an anti-foaming agent do? It reduces foaming, right? pH buffers, they adjust pH up or down. Compatibility agents, they help combine pesticides or pesticide with a fertilizer. Drift control, they reduce drift or potential of drift and the hazard of drift. Emulsifiers, they allow petroleum-based products to be mixed with water. Extenders, they increase the pesticidal activeness. Invert emulsifiers, they allow water-based products to mix with a petroleum carrier. Penetrance allows pesticides to pass through treated foliage. Safeners reduce toxicity to handlers or treated surface. Spreader, it allows pesticide to form an even coating of treated area. Stickers allow pesticide to stay on the treated surface increase adhesion, reduce wash off, reduce evaporation, and slow photodegradation. Surfactant. It alters the wetting, spreading, and dispersing of spray droplets. Thickeners. They increase the viscosity of spray mixtures. Wetting agents. Allow wettable powders to mix with water. So there's a lot of them, right? So that's why I tried to, to say them as best I could and slow so that way you can remember them. Okay, surfactants. Most common adjuvant used. Uh, change the physical properties of water surface tension. Results in better coverage. Uh, increased odds of pests will come into contact with the pesticide. Helpful when treating waxy or hairy leaves. That's mainly um, when you're trying to treat with an herbicide and kill some plants. You want to penetrate the wax or get past the hair. And there's multiple types. There's Anionic, cationic, and non-ionic. So we're going to go through those types right now. Anionic is a negative charge. It's mainly used with contact pesticides. Cationic is positively charged. It's phytotoxic and can be and should not be used alone. Non-ionic has no electrical charge, common with systemic products, helps penetration, and compatible with most pesticides. I will say that majority of the surfactants that I've used were non-ionic. Surfactants cause pesticides to behave differently. Using the incorrect surfactant can increase or decrease efficacy, damage plants and surfaces. Choosing the right adjuvant. So first off, read the label the label will tell you what to use. And they might have different recommendations based on the site. So you want to read and follow the label's instructions. Many products already contain adjuvants. So know that if you're going to add one, you might not need to. Use adjuvants manufactured for agricultural or horticultural purposes. Do not use household detergents. And I got a story about that because I was actually trained originally by the first company when I was first licensed to add um, laundry detergent to my sprays. 
and it was completely against what the book says. So don't do that. Uh, no adjuvant is a substitute for good practices, right? It's uh, adding an adjuvant is not going to make you a better pesticide applicator or worse. You just need to have good practices. Um, be skeptical of claims. Some adjuvants might claim that you know they're the cat's meow and they're gonna you're gonna dominate and you're gonna reduce your pesticide usage by half. Blah blah blah. Don't believe it. You know, test it out in small areas. Do small mixes, small areas for tests, and see how it responds and how it works.